Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our DAT IQ weekly market update. This is our update for September 20th, 2022. I'm Ken Animo, Chief of Analytics over here at DAT. I'm joined by Alex Perry, who's filling in for Dean Croak. Alex runs our data analytics services team, and we have a very special returning guest. We have Nicole Glenn, who's president and CEO of Candor Expedite. Good morning. 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 How's everyone doing? Great. I'm doing, Thanks. Yeah. Great. I uh, just recovering from a late night shuttle back from Chicago. So oh. I'm going to get you live from my house today. Nice. And you're down in Texas. Do you have any college football alliances down there? Oh, my gosh. No, because we are like born and raised Chicago. So oh. every flag in our house is actually tor pointed towards the Chicago Bears, unfortunately. Oh, bear down bears. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they got a bit of a beating this weekend by the Packers. It's typical. It's typical. We don't like to talk about it, but yeah, yeah. it's typical. Alex, I, I can't remember. Do you have any college football alliances? That's how we start the show in the fall. For sure. College college football, not so much. Not so much. No. Mm -hmm. I, my, uh, this is dangerous to say in Portland, Oregon, but um, my stepdad is an ASU fan. So. Oh, they just fired Herm Edwards. They fired him on the field. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bummer. Pretty that's yeah. a bummer. Well, I'm excited. The Buckeyes open Big Ten play against Wisconsin. It's a blackout. I'm dragging my wife down there against her will. She's not really thrilled with the idea of portable toilets and standing the entire time, but, you know, she'll get over it. All right. So for those unfamiliar with the show, we talk about more than college football and portable toilets. We talk about the freight markets, trends we're seeing, and then we often have special guests. So before we dive into the show, I wanted to um, ask Nicole just to reintroduce herself before we get rolling, uh, before she comes back for the end. Um, so take it away, Nicole. Sure. Hi, everybody. Nicole Glenn, uh, CEO and founder of Candor Expedite, a company that was founded in 2017 on the emphasis of hotshot ground services and uh, started that company up in Chicago and have been expanding to different markets. So I have relocated to the Plano, Texas market uh, and just opened our second office down here. So we've been in growth mode, adding some additional modes of multimodal, so different expedited LTL services, first and final mile and air now too. So lots of good stuff happening over here at, at Candor. And as a alumnus from the expedite industry of seven years myself, that's why I'm always excited when you join us on the show. And spoiler alert, you'll be joining us for a session at DadCon. So more on that later, I'm gonna dive us into the key points of the week for now to get us moving. So line haul rates fall below 2018 levels uh, for flatbed and reefer equipment types. Reefer um, less worrisome than the trends we're seeing in flatbed, but more on that uh, from Alex later. Uh, Hurricane Fiona causing widespread damage to Puerto Rico. It seems like from early reports they were uh, much better prepared than during Hurricane Maria, um, but it was a, not nearly as strong of a storm. And we're hoping that steers clear of the East Coast and just causes some uh, trouble for fish out there in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, shift in import volumes uh, remains in place away from the West Coast. So you see Gulf Coast up 11.8%, East Coast up 13 West Coast up 4%. And then luckily that rail strike was averted last week. There's going to be a lot to unpack from this. However, um, these wage and benefit increases will not um, happen in a vacuum, right? They will ripple throughout the supply chain. So with that, oh, and by the way, as I mentioned, we have um, an expert on expedite and specialty on the show with us today. So get those questions in early. I know there will be a ton uh, and we'd love to spend all morning with you all, but we don't have that much time. So go ahead and get those questions in early. And with that, I will turn it over to Alex for the market update. Alex. Thanks, Ken. Um, we'll just kind of jump right into the load to truck ratios on the dry van side, uh, dry van load to truck ratio sees a return to normal shipping patterns after the short work week, um, after following Labor Day. Load post volumes increased 13% week over week. Uh, truck posts also rebounded and were up 14% last week. These increases are in line with the week over week changes we've seen in prior years, the week after Labor Day. And um, that higher increase in truck posts is what drove the dry van load to truck ratio ever so slightly down by about one percent last week um, and on the reefer load to truck ratio side um, it's also recovering from the short work week 
Reefer load posts increased 7% last week, 39% lower than previous year, but 40% higher than 2018. We saw a lot of increased load posting activity across the board, in, across all three equipment types, which is kind of why those red lines you'll notice are a bit higher. Reefer carrier truck posts increased 11% week over week and are at the highest levels found this year in 22. Carrier equipment posts are still at levels surpassing 2018 by about 24% and are up 26% year over year. Um, as a result, reefer load to truck ratio decreased by 4% week over week from 6.8 to around 6.5. Um, and in the flatbed load to truck ratio, side flatbed load posts are around 60 percent lower compared to the previous year and two percent lower than 2018 levels which was a good year for flatbed carriers load posts also increased eight percent week over week um, from the short work week equipment posts are up 18 percent week over week and 45 percent year over year highlighting the softening flatbed market largely due to the housing market slowdown as a result the flatbed load to truck ratio decreased week over week from 14.3 to 13.1. Um, <clears throat> moving on to market conditions, um, maps across the board are looking uh, very similar to last week. Uh, on the dry van side, key important and retail e-commerce markets remaining hot, uh, specific focus on Houston, Southern California, and the greater New York, New Jersey areas um, extending down uh, into Harrisburg. Uh, imports arriving on containers will begin moving through the domestic supply chain ahead of the retail peak this fall. Um, on the reefer side, a bit of a better picture here compared to the dry van with multiple pockets of red uh, around the country. Uh, drought and heat-stricken areas out of the West remain healthy for refrigerated loads. Various harvest markets in the Midwest are extending up in, uh, sorry, extending up into New England also provide opportunity for high paying loads there. Finally, in flatbed, don't let the red fool you. The flatbed market remains relatively soft. The Pacific Northwest and lower Southeast are bright spots, but for a map that's typically covered with red, the flatbed picture is actually relatively bleak. Housing and commercial construction are the primary culprit, culprits, excuse me, for this sluggishness driven by higher interest rates. Mm, On to rates, um, the dry van spot rates have seen a relatively flat trend this month, and this week is no exception. The national average dry van line haul rate dropped about one cent or so last week uh, to 18, uh, 182 per mile. Um, compared to the top 50 lanes, which averaged at 224 a mile, the national average was 42 cents per mile lower last week. Dry van line haul rates are 63 cents a mile lower than the previous year spot rate surge, but are still 21 cents a mile higher than the average of pre-pandemic years. On to reefer, a uh, similar kind of story. Reefer line haul spot rates have also dropped about a penny below the 2018 spot rates for the first time this year. Last week's rate decreased by three cents a mile to national average of 214 a mile. Reefer spot rates are down seven cents a mile month over month and 69 cents per mile lower than the previous year. Last week's average spot rate is still 22 cents a mile higher than the pre-pandemic average for the second week of September. Finally, on the flatbed side, Flatbed line haul rates continued to fall last week to 213 a mile, down five cents week over week, highlighting the reduced demand in the flatbed market. Spot excuse me, spot rates are now 50 cents a mile lower than the previous year and fell about a penny below the 2018 rate. And that is it for this week's market update. Um, if you want to find out more what's happening in freight, go to dat.com slash market update and download our weekly report. 
with that, I turn it back over to Ken for the short-term forecasts. Ken? Thank you, Alex. I really appreciate you jumping on. I know those are massive shoes to fill uh, sitting in for the illustrious Dean Croak, uh, especially in the market update piece. That's, uh, that's never easy, especially on short notice, so I greatly appreciate it. Uh, so let's talk about some forecasts. Um, it's some spicy disagreement here, right? So let's just level set on what these charts represent. So the blue line is the actual history observed by DAT. Those are long haul, in this case, drive in, uh, seven day rolling average rates, excluding fuel per mile. Uh, the red line is the short term forecast that weights recent history much heavier. Uh, the green line is rate cast. That's our production, um, rate forecasting algorithm, which you'll see in all of our products. And then the two middle gray and yellow lines are mixtures of the two in different blends, uh, just to kind of give you uh, an intermediate picture. So as you can see, Raycast really wants peak to take effect, right? This is uh, we're leading into the retail shipping peak. Um, it, it seems to think we're going to get a boost. It's picking up um, some of the early signals that we perhaps saw from the potential rail strike last week as evidence of peak coming in. We'll have to see this week if that trend holds. The short-term forecast is not that optimistic. It has rates diving down pretty hard. Uh, let's go to reefer for a second, because I think you're going to see a same, very similar disagreement. Um, the mid models are very much in agreement through the beginning of October with the short-term forecast, and then begin to de begin to deviate a little bit. Rate cast remains a bit optimistic, again with the short-term uh, forecast being rather pessimistic. And then we're going to dive into flatbed, which um, again I think rate cast is holding on to some. In this case, I would think rather hopeless optimism. Um, the short-term forecast is, again, very pessimistic. Uh, I think, honestly, where we're going to probably see things lie is somewhere in the middle. Um, the Fed's meeting today, interest rates continue to be a downward pressure on the housing and commercial construction markets. I think as long as that persists, we will see softness in the flatbed market, which is unfortunate. Uh, but that is just sort of where we are with that. So after that quick stroll through the data, um, we're going to bring everyone back here and get to our question of the week, which is why we have Nicole on the program, which is, what are some of the big issues in the expedited and specialty freight market right now? Yeah, I was like, big issue. There's big issues, which I think we all see in, in regards to the transportation industry. They're, they're always there, no matter the mode, right? Um, and the expedited side, for me, I mean, we're just coming off a of driver appreciation week. So one of the things that we constantly think about and talk about is really drivers and how they have to do things differently than your your standard tractor trailer driver on quality of life you know we have a lot of ladies gentlemen who are roaming the u.s in a sprinter van right uh, and trying to have some quality of life on where they stay and how they can actually improve that on a day-to-day -day, uh, lifestyle was one of the things our group talked about. I did bring this to the round table of my team and said, what do you guys think? So that's why we got quite a few different answers. One of them that I truly believe too is data, right? So that we are no stranger to that in our industry or really industries globally on all these different data sets that are coming to companies. Um, whether it's pricing, whether it's utilizing different platforms, uh, the expedited market is still a little old school. I like to say yeah. uh, with that. So it's it's more of working hand in hand with your continual service providers, getting buckets of rates, supplying them back to customers and trying to obtain and create some sort of benchmarking uh, for the expedited market has been a challenge for sure. Alongside of TMSs. So I can keep going. You can stop me and interject, <laughs> Ken. <laughs> well, I'm curious what... I mean, you know, one of the things we're going to be talking about at DATCON here in a few weeks is kind of the big pillars when you're talking. We have Jason Frederick joining us from Miller Transfer, who's a, a specialized in flatbed uh, asset based carrier. You know, we're going to talk about some of those big tenants. But I think one of the things we're going to drive home is that need for transparency right. um, in this industry. I mean, do you feel like that's generally lacking amongst um, some of the players in the expedite and specialized industry? Sure. I mean, I think it's lacking amongst everything, whether you're communicating directly with the driver, a shipper, um, I mean, all, all, all over through supply chain communications, a problem. We still play the game of telephone. Right. And so alleviating that issue by creating that transparency and really setting that expectation and communicating outward um, is something that companies really need to strive to do for sure. 
Yeah, and you mentioned quality of life. I mean, are you, um, over the last few years, especially during COVID, have you seen, I mean, I know like team drivers are one of the, the, the holy grails on the expedite side. Have you seen um, any sort of difficulty, I mean, harder than normal, recruiting them, retaining them? You know, how have they sort of had their quality of life impacted by COVID? Well, for sure. I mean, it's not even just uh, team drivers, it's solo drivers too. Definitely. I mean, some of these folks are out on the road even that much longer when, when everything was at peak, you know, um, they were constantly moving with not a lot of breaks. And with the expedited industry not being as regulated, uh, I'm sure there were some companies that really pushed their drivers to the limits uh, with that, you know, not having to keep an e-log if it's a sprinter van. With the straight truck, you obviously have to keep that. But that demand was so high um, for the drivers at that point in time that they're just constantly shuffling all across. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen the makeshift uh, bed that's in the back of a sprinter van, you know, some of these folks pretty much live in that unit uh throughout the country yeah i mean have you uh, did you see much uh pick up in in rail and intermodal recovery when the rail strike was sort of looming or was that had, had it not gotten that far at that point it hadn't it hadn't i mean we had some customers coming out to us in advance and saying hey you know we have our truckload uh plans you know trying to have a contingency plan be on standby so we were obviously following that market and to see what was going to transpire, but uh, saved by the bell, I guess, for a lot of shippers out there. But it was different. I've never had clients come in advance. I think from the pandemic, people are starting to look at warning signs a little different. Um, and so they were starting to go, hey, you're my contingency plan. What are we doing? And kind of setting that up just due to the fact that, you know, you don't really know what's going to happen with rates immediately and how long that was going to stay. Uh, my thought process was it wouldn't be very long with something like that. So I didn't right. see that as a huge uptick for our industry, but just a little couple of days. I, I, that was my thought if it did happen. Yeah, I think that was kind of general sentiment. And there were some doom and gloomers out there, but I think most folks had a bit more of a tempered approach, kind of like a prepare, but wait and see was yeah. the most common approach that I saw. Alex, you're, you, you get a ton of questions all the time about specialty and expedited. Do you have anything for Nicole? putting me on the spot. I, I don't. Um, I'm trying to think now. Um, I guess, perhaps, how do you navigate the exceptions for your type of freight you're moving, right? During negotiations or setting expectations with customers and carriers and every everybody in that realm? Well, it's really that communication game that we were talking about yeah. the telephone. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people just want to go, here's your PO number and here's your phone number, go get it. Um, and then they want to constantly ask afterwards where the freight is and how it's tracking. It's actually having the audacity to slow your customer down. I think a lot of people just want to go, my customer's asking me a question. I got to answer it. But it's really going, hey, in order to have a successful shipment, we need this, 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 this. What do you expect here? Um, and really slow them down and then put that in your booking process. So we've all seen it, dry van, flatbed, whatever uh, mode we're talking about. If anything changes after a load's in transit, that's when a lot of problems seem to come. Whether it's changing a delivery location, a driver needs to lay over, um, anything really is when the problems come. So our team is really focused on learning our customers, especially the reoccurring clients, so that way we, we understand those things and how the customer works. You know, we have some clients that will say, hey, deliver at 10 p.m. and we're going, we know no one's gonna be there. So we should technically try to book this in advance for a layover and then really communicate that to our carrier base. So they're understanding what's required instead of that after something's booked, uh, disarray of now I have to sleep here. Now I have to, and that communication is essential and asking those questions up front or planning for it. Our contingency plan, uh, for some of our loads that we know our customers are going to have issues with. So just to move on before we move on to customer, uh, listener questions, what's one thing if you could wave your magic wand, you would ask shippers to do, um, to be better shippers of choice in the expedited industry. Oh my gosh. <laughs> You're saying one question. Well, Just first, one. 
First of all, I will say this, and I don't know if it's the perfect answer that you're looking for. We see a lot of shippers that are still utilizing uh, standard companies for expedited needs, right? Um, and then we're going in and recovering some of those shipments. So they'll still want to run it through their routing guide, their carrier routing guide, uh, and put a team set of team drivers on that, or they'll put it on a guaranteed LTL service. Um, and, and they're wondering why it's not, not delivering on time. So I would say, trust the pros, look at the companies that actually specialize in these niches. I know it's very easy to want to have a one source button for every single service you do, but it's going to pay back so much. If you say, here's our primary expedited pool of carriers, here's our primary uh, truckload pool of carriers and here's our primary expedited carriers so everybody's you know in their niche and they're going to perform to their best levels and i think that would make a world of a difference uh for shippers out there i like that i also always love when people say guaranteed ltl that's like a, I know. Just a it's like it's like giant shrimp it's, it's like do you know what you're saying you should have a sign on your head it's, it's yeah. not gonna happen most of the time all right, let's get to some uh, listener questions here. I'm going to do these in kind of reverse order. So a question for Nicole. How has Candor leveraged independent dispatch agencies when staffing high volume and or high demand freight opportunities consistent with a peak season? Well, I saw the name on there, so that's Jory. So hi, Jory. Uh, he's a gentleman that I've, I've talked to in the past. And just to answer your question, we really have not gone to the independent dispatch agencies. Um, it's... I don't want to say it's new. I mean, it's been around forever, but we've not really had a lot of introductions from companies that specialize in that. And I think it's created some concerns uh, for individuals with really how they're being represented, some of the drivers. So I know that you are on a mission to try to combat that. Um, but at the same time, we have not really stepped into that space yet. We've been using our, our consistent carriers uh, that we've been working with and then onboarding new uh, over over the pass of, of peak season. So can't really give you a good answer yet, except uh, reach out to me and, and, and educate me more on, on the benefits of this. Yeah, dispatch services are to like, I can't get the mental model I have for a dispatcher is like a freight Swiss army knife who sits in the office of a carrier and moves freight, right? I, this whole concept of like an independent dispatcher is something I'm trying to wrap my head around. I mean, we have thousands of them in the network and I just, um, I'm still trying to wrap my head around like what that business model looks like and like, are they a broker? Or are they not a broker? So I think that's going to be a, a big theme over the next couple of years, honestly. Yeah, I think they can bring some value because in the expedited freight market, we have a lot of independent people. Um, and then they tend to sign on for companies and potentially get taken advantage of, right? They don't get that transparency no, for sure. of the dispatcher. So I think the dispatch platform, if it's done correctly, is to really alleviate that and have that transparency with, with the drivers and kind of giving them that power. Um, and we all know this, I'm sorry to say it, but a lot of truck drivers... And if you are this exception, I give you kudos, are not really great at the business side of things, you know. So whether it's collecting their money or sending off paperwork, it's not it's not their primary running all of their logs. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, their uh, debt record or wow, tongue tied fuel records and all sorts yeah. of things to keep keep their company moving is really not their strength. So if the dispatch service can assist them, I think it's a pro. Yeah, I remember the little out of service blip that would happen right before tax season when they would all go out of service to rush to get to a place to prepare their taxes. And I always thought like if I like if I ever hit the lottery, the thing I would do to keep myself busy is to like set up a little mobile tax stand in TA parking lots right right around the <laughs> right around the right around the uh, April time frame. All right. So next question from Mark or from Matt Clark, who's a Georgia Bulldogs fan. Uh, what are your thoughts on FedEx's financial news last week about the drop off in revenue and earnings? Is that related to global economic economy and freight or specific to FedEx only? Any other comments before I try to not get in trouble with this question? Well, I'm just rewinding back to last year or however long ago it was when FedEx was like, hey, customers, we don't need your freight. And they dropped off a bunch of customers. So that's the first thing I saw when I saw that question. But I would love to hear yours first. Oh, boy. Go Alex, anything? <laughs> anything, Alex? Help. <laughs> back to you, Ken. <laughs> so I think... As most, I mean, most people watching this know, I was at FedEx for seven years uh, before joining. And I think 
st- speaking strictly to the facts, they are much more exposed globally than UPS is, right? They, UPS has actually taken measures to even reduce their North American exposure. They divested their, um, some of their LTL and Canadian operations. So I, I, it's hard to say, right? They're, they're losing a lot of those single two and three digit employee numbers over the last few years. I mean, with, with, with the chairman, Fred Smith, sort of stepping away, relinquishing title after title, it's a totally new management regime over there, by and large, right? And it's going to continue to be that way over the next few years. I mean, they were lucky enough to have some of those low-digit employees. And by the way, when I say that, that Fred's employee number is one. <laughs> it's kind of like a thing at FedEx, right? And they all kind of go up from there. Mine was 2590101. So they kind of go up from there. And I, I think it just brings with it a change in philosophy and a change in strategy. And, and, and having that exposure to some of the more emerging markets that are taking the brunt of this economic slowdown globally, it's not surprising that it manifests itself in the financial statements. Um, global priority freight is where their bread is buttered, if you look at their financial statements. Uh, global parcel, uh, global ex- express parcel um, and package and, and, and letter. And those things, I have to imagine, have, have slowed down at a much faster clip than North American truckload freight, which has slowed down at a, at a decent clip. So um, in absence of revenue, they still got the planes, they've still got all the employees, they've still got all the facilities. I mean, I think buried in that was they're closing corporate facilities, they're closing office locations, they're closing terminals. So I think they're going to be in, in for a bit of a cost restructure here over the next few years. And that's all from reading the public statements, right? That's not from any sort of inside information. This is all publicly available info. Um, well, I'm glad you answered that because you you beat me on that answer for sure. <laughs> yeah, and it pains me to read that kind of stuff. I mean, not financially. I, I don't have any more financial interest in FedEx, but um, it, I love that company. And uh, they, they're they a ter- ter- tremendous company from a leadership perspective. I have a lot of mentors that um, I was so thankful to work with over there. But again, with, with changing of the guard comes a lot of um, changes. I mean, for lack of, I mean, that's not very eloquently said, but I have to imagine that Raj Subramaniam, the new uh, CEO and president over there, is going to have a much different style and approach than Fred, and it's going to have to sort of find his way to define the next 30 to 40 years of what that company looks like. So, all right, another question. Ooh, boy, we got some spicy ones today. Gary Bates, I haven't heard from Gary in a while. Uh, If I own all assets and drive the truck, then costs are likely to lower than any other organization question when are brokers going to recognize that the spot market is emergency capacity and at a premium price point not below cost model that's a great question there's different segments to our industry gary so i like to say that there are the ex true expedites that really are you know trust paid loads meaning the customer understands the value of getting that to point a to point b um, and now we're starting to see what I like to call a lot of the non-expedite expedite, right? Where some of the shippers are really getting smart and stopping the utilization of tractor trailer for one to three to 12 skids, or trying to put that some of these uh, shipments on, on LTL and seeing a lot of damage. So you're seeing a lot of customers try to transition with that expedited piece and it's not the true spot. Um, I think it's really working with the brokers that you develop their relationships with and understanding their strategy, like what types of clients are they going after? Are they working with other brokerages themselves? Are they working in the freight forwarding market? Are they in the automotive sector? So my suggestion to you is really understand what vertical that you're looking to service that can bring you the most bang for your buck. Um, If you're just doing everyday pedal runs, which some people do with expedited equipment, you might not see that big return on your investment. Uh, for that. So I do think that they do recognize it. I think you just got to find the right partners that are servicing those types of customers that have that emergency freight because we get a lot of quote requests for shipments that are expedite, but they're not on fire. Um, So obviously customers are looking for the best pricing available for that type of shipment. Yeah. I mean, Gary, I, I would challenge, and, I, and you have a long history of asking really good questions, controversial questions, so I'll push back on this one. I don't think the spot market is for emergency freight anymore. They're, they're, at, at 25% of total North American freight volume, it's, I think it's, I'm sure a lot of it is, but I can't, I don't think you can broad brush say that all spot freight is emergency freight. I'd also say that I, I think it's a fallacy that brokers set price. I know that it's a fallacy that brokers set prices. Brokers are buying the truck from 
the carrier. The carrier is the price setter. The broker is the price taker in this. And brokers are only going to pay what carriers are willing to sell it to them for. And that's really not like rose colored glass. I mean, that's literally how it works, right? We all know that even if we don't think about it front of mind. So um, when there's more trucks than there are loads in a given area or that balance is out of whack, carriers are willing to dip below their all in cost and just pay their variable costs to keep the wheels turning. That's when you start to see prices dip below costs. Um, also, everyone has a different cost structure, right? You might be competing against a truck that has a much lower cost to run. Maybe the truck's paid off or the, you know, they're part of a five or six truck fleet with a group buy on insurance or whatever the case may be. So they might be able to run cheaper than you. Not you. I'm talking about like the inclusive you here. Um, so I think it's just one of those things where the spot market transacts where supply meets demand. And I get there's a little this, that's kind of a Pollyannish view of kind of how the market works in a way, right? Because there is there is that little wiggle room in the middle of like where negotiation happens, right? Can a better carrier maybe get a few more cents per mile off a um, less experienced broker when it comes to negotiations? Sure. Um, and the same could be said in the opposite direction. But by and large, the, the market sets the price, not any one participant in the market. I agree with that. And the time of day can alter uh, the, the pricing in the expedited market. So I think I would suggest to you too, looking at some of those off hour times, you know, we're in areas that our people are really in their time of need because Ken's right. I mean, we have to go to our customer base and try to be competitive as well um, to win that business. So there really is, there really is no setting uh, the bar. Uh, on what we're trying to pay. It's just trying to get that job done and really how urgent it is. Yeah. And we're on the, you know, we're in early uh, adopter testing for a pricing, a new pricing product that thinks about day of week. And we're already gearing up next year to start thinking about um, time of day. Let me spoiler alert. But, um, and again, it's coming with great results because you're right. The, the, an 8 a.m. pickup on Friday in Chicago is a hell of a lot different than a 5 p.m. pickup. Yeah. Right. Or Especially a, if it's a short run. Saturday evening run, you know, it's, yeah. it's totally different. So yep. I, that's a great, that's a great concept. I'm glad you guys are stepping into that. Yeah. It's fun. It's incredibly difficult and maddening at times, but it's fun. We have fun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm glad I don't have to actually, I mean, again, I think one of the greatest blessings of coming to DAT other than like the great team I get to work with and kind of staying in the industry is I've not had to actually move freight over the last three years. So I have tremendous respect for those that have, um, I'm just thankful that I've gotten to help, uh, but not lose the hours and hours of sleep because I had a giant bid sitting on my desk that was due Friday. Yep. Um, I don't miss that part of the job. All right. So I'm going to wrap us up. We're running about a few minutes long here. So DATCON, I put the link in the chat on LinkedIn. I'm sure someone from marketing can drop that in YouTube for me. Uh, you can still register. Um, it's not that expensive, um, for, for, especially for what you get. We've got the Blonde Bomber, right? Terry Bradshaw is going to be there. and Nicole's going to be there. We've got great industry luminaries. Um, from brokerage, from carriers, uh, some of our partners in the industry. Um, Alex is going to be there with his team. My product managers are going to be there. My counterpart in the freight match and load board side is going to have all of her product managers there. Um, it's going to be really three days chock full of learning and networking and all kind of super fun stuff, plus great barbecue. We throw one heck of a party. I think it's Thursday night with really great music and great food and, again, great networking. Um, and you can stay over and, and go to Austin City Limits. Uh, the first day is the first weekend is right after DATCON. So I highly recommend you check that out. I think our session, Nicole, is on Thursday. That's right. Yeah, yeah it is. Yep. There's a yeah, lot so of really, really great breakouts uh, in this conference. So I'm really excited to meet some of the people attending. Yeah, we got Tom yeah. Curie coming. I believe Andy Smith is coming. We've got um, uh, some folks from Arrive Logistics. It's going to be really, really fun. And I think, too, it's, it's something for everyone, right? If you're kind of getting into the industry or just learning, you're going to go to Alex's sessions, right? Because he gets like hand over mouse with a learning lab teaching you how to use rate view, rate cast, MCI, um, all of these different products. If you're more high level, let's say you're an operations manager or a sales manager, you can sit in on like bidding strategy or getting into specialized freight. I can't tell you how many brokers I've talked to that want to get into specialized or flatbed and they don't know the rules of the road or how many carriers want to maybe break away from just FAK and get into some specialized or expedite. It's going to be something for everyone. So um, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, it's the first time we'll have shippers there too. So uh, shippers will be there for the, for the most of the week. And some really big name shippers. I think you'll all be very interested um, in talking with. So with that, I'm going to sign us off. I want to thank Nicole. Um, thank we'll be you. seeing her again a few weeks in person. I want to thank Alex for filling in. Um, Dean, 
just relentless dedication to his craft actually did um, from his anniversary trip, write the market update uh, with Christina, um, who's on his team. Um, I know he provided input and Christina did the bulk of the heavy lifting there. So that market update is available on our website. That didn't miss a beat. Um, and with that, we will see you next week. And I hope everyone has a great week. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye.